All right. Hello and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're really excited to have so many people log in. Uh, we have quite a few people who signed up for this, so we're going to give people a bit of time to join the live stream. Um, we're really excited today to have yet another session of the Earth Engine User Meetup. And we have a special guest today, um, Kahe Chow. Kahe Chow, who will be speaking about um, the cloud application for EO-based climate and disaster risk assessment, uh, CCDR approach. So let me share a little bit uh, more about uh, what we're doing here as people come into the room. Um, we, we always start with a bit of an introduction to um, the Earth Engine User Meetup and our company Thrive Geo, where this meetup is being hosted. And we also then um, give you some information about the upcoming meetups and what to expect, how you can be a speaker as well. And then we also have a presentation by our guest speaker. And at the end of the presentation, we invite everyone to log in uh, and also ask questions on Slido. So if you have a mobile phone, I encourage you to get it ready because later on there will be a QR code that you can um, snap with your phone. And this will be used to connect to Slido and you can post your questions there um, for us to do the interactions with our speaker. So that's a bit of an overview for uh, what's happening uh, during the session. And I will now also move my screen to share a little bit more. Okay, to the next slide. So welcome to the, the Thrive Geo community platform. Uh, this is the second time we're hosting the Earth Engine user meetup here. Um, this is because our platform has, well, 200 uh, live stream capacity and a great recording system. So we want to make sure that these uh, meetups are recorded and so we can post them to YouTube afterwards. Um, our community is a place for geospatial professionals and users of geospatial and earth observation data together. And in addition, we also provide training. For example, we have an upcoming course on geospatial cloud computing. And we also do consulting. And our aim as a company is to empower as many people as possible to use this data and achieve their goals. So a little bit about the Earth Engine User Meetups in case this is the first time that you're joining us. It's a meetup that is run for users by users. I'm also an Earth Engine user and I'm also a Google developer expert for Earth Engine. And what we do is that we invite community members to come and share their work, um, what they are doing currently on um, Earth Engine for research or projects that they have developed. It's free and open for anyone to join. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are new to Earth Engine or you're extremely advanced or it's the first time you heard about it. Um, it's a, basically a place for us to, to gather and exchange ideas and um, exchange information. So everyone here is a volunteer uh, in terms of the speakers, and we, we would love to have you as well come and speak in the future. We still have quite a few open spots for the rest of the year. So why should you be a speaker? First, um, it's a great way to share your expertise and help others uh, because uh, there might be other people who are also working on similar topics or struggling with something that you managed to figure out and you can share what you learn and help, help them out. It's a great place to practice public speaking and communication because our field is so diverse. People are coming from many different backgrounds. It's a great way to practice explaining what you're doing in a way that people who are not from your domain field can also understand. And that's a very valuable um, skill set to have today. And last but not least, it's a great place to also build your personal brand. Um, tell a story about who you are, what you do, and have this video in the future to add to your portfolio, something that you can share online. So this is another way which you can benefit as a speaker from the Earth Engine user meetups. So if you're interested to make sure you don't miss the future, any future meetups, um, please feel free to sign up for our monthly newsletter. We will share event links to all the upcoming um, events 
also in our newsletter. So we welcome you to sign up using this link here, um, bit.ly slash thrivegeo. And if you can't make this time, maybe this is a bad time zone issue for you, feel free to catch up on all the recordings online. We have a YouTube channel at Earth Engine User Meetup. Um, you can subscribe and you'll get a notification every time we upload a new video. So that's another way that you can stay in touch with us. So we have um, meetups planned for April and May and also June. Um, our April speaker is Kristen O'Shea from the Desert Research Institute. She'll be sharing about Climate Engine, tools for analyzing climate and remote sensing data. That's going to be on um, not the 12th of March, but the 12th of April. So I will fix that afterwards. And in May, we have uh, um, Dr. Emma Esquerdo Verdigier from University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. And this will be on the 10th of May. So feel free to join us for the next um, two meetups. And we look forward to seeing you again at one of these meetups. So before I mention something about personal branding, uh, I also wanted to let you know that uh, next Wednesday, again, here in the community, we are having a one hour workshop from Francesca Furchgott, who is a content marketing expert on personal branding. Um, we are also gonna record this so people can watch it um, asynchronously at your own time. Uh, Francesca will be answering questions uh, up to a week within the community space asynchronously as well. And we are going to have um, a three week challenge where we encourage our community members to post about their experiences trying to put into practice some of the personal branding tips that they will learn from, from Francesca. So if you're interested to take part in this challenge with us, uh, feel free to scan this QR code or go to bit.ly bit slash personal brand 24. And um, you can purchase a seat at the workshop and join us for the challenge. Without further ado, thanks so much for your attention so far. I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Kahe Chao, to join us on stage. And um, Kahe is a Earth observation uh, scientist and developed this cloud application as a consultant for the World Bank. Um, Kahe is from Hong Kong, but is now based in Germany. And we would um, yeah, want to give a virtual round of applause and welcome uh, Kahe to the stage. So welcome, Kahe. So um, welcome, everyone. Um, first, I let me share screen. Okay. That seems to be. So first, first of all, just a question. Do you, you see my, my screen well? Thank you. It's showing now. OK, yeah. So um, yeah, I'm happy to see see everyone here. Um, also happy, happy to um, to stand here to to show you you know a little bit about uh, what I have been working um, using Google Earth Engine. So I yeah. So I, I'm Kahi. Um, now based in Germany. I'm, I'm Germany in Ulm, um, close to Munich in Germany. And um, last year I was um, working as a consultant at the World Bank Group. So I was under the Poverty Reduction and Equity Group. Um, there I'm, um, they have the framework of the CCDR, we, which we are trying to um, you know, put more um, information, particularly based on Earth observation data to do some climate risk assessment um, in the World Group. So yeah, I, I have been using Google Earth Engine, you know, since a few years, and and last year this is really um one of um my project that I'm I'm trying to see like really explore the potential of this like application, um yeah to go further um and and develop like application that um could be used um professionally. So yeah, maybe I want to share a little bit with you, you know, the context of our work group. So first of all, first of all, like like what is the CCDR? So CCDR is the Country Climate and Development Report um that are published by the World Bank. So every year, um as our focus is in Pakistan, so we mostly focus on uh in Pakistan and it's kind of like a 
like a diagnostic report to see how different development goals regarding sustainability uh, could be achieved, particularly um, under the context of, of climate change. Um, and we and this is report is really like um, having like the audience of, for example, policymakers, um, and this is like really evidence based like report of and resource on what action are we getting climate change and climate resilience uh, should be prioritized um, in like let's say the project funding and so on. So um, this report is really focused on the relationship not only um, for the lateral hazard itself but also on the relationship between um, the climate hazard, the meteorological risk, which are the things that can be influenced by climate change and their relationship um, to the society. So in a broader scale, it's not about um, where the flooding can go, but like what are the potential impact, like what um, group of the population that might be, you know, um, suffering and, and there may be poverty that being damaged and um, also influence in the economic situation um, and so on. So those relationships are um, what our work group is focusing on um, analyzing. And so it covers different kinds of lateral hazards, for example, like drought, um, flooding, um, extreme heat wave event, um, and so on. So this is just like a demonstration of how, you know, this lateral hazard can be linked to the society dimension. So we are not looking into, for example, the flooding, um, like on the, the upper wall, but we are looking at how flooding, for example, influence, um, you know, we flood like the harvest um, of the agricultural field and how are they impacted, how much loss are there. We also know, want to know the relationship, not only by how high is the temperature or how long is it, but how does it relate to the population that are working, let's say manual labor or working in an outdoor environment as they are most vulnerable to heat waves. So we also want to know how drought um, that is impacting, let's say the income like of the local farmers and, and those, the people dimension is the um, topic that we really like to focus. And why are, we are looking at extreme heat here, um, as I said, we are focusing on different kinds of lateral hazard, but as like some experiment on building the whole framework. So extreme heat is one of the most important topic we come up first. Um, as maybe we all know that Pakistan is really at the front line of cl um, cl current climate crisis. So um, it really is in the climate zone that exposed to many different kinds of lateral hazard, like for example, with heat wave event um, or landslide as well as flooding. Like even though we would say that, you know, when we look at the, the carbon footprint and the emission that they have, the Pakistan, you know, are having pretty much like very minimal impact. However, when we look at the consequence of climate change, we see like like they are pretty exposed um, to a lot of like different issues. And and if we are modeling the climate and see how is the future impact is like, we know that it will, yeah, probably um causing much more issue also, not only currently or that, what it does already, but um, also in the near future. So uh, yes, this is just some, you know, headline about how climate change are influencing Pakistan. Uh, for example, it is like frequently um, suffering from a lot of like extreme heat wave event and it will, you know, become even more frequent in the future. Um, so heat is also become more likely as, we look at how, you know, the climate of, of projection is like, depend on which scenario we look at. And we also know that the heat rate um, influence different, you know, different group of population differently. For example, like um, the children um, or like in general, weaker population, like the senior people, they are more exposed to, um, to like heat rate event and their public health will be much more impacted than, you know, uh, Elder that is mostly see indoor and doesn't need to work outside. So like those factors are pretty much very important and not only like look at like the temperature data itself. Um, so this is uh, the thing we try to do and we try to really connect the different type of data. So we have data, let's say with the temperature and how the, um, the climate like hazard is like, but we also want to know the people. So this is how we look at then the risk assessment itself. Um, so we have the hazard, like for example, we have the heat rate, we have like the climate data, but what we actually want to know that we need some data about the people. Like we want to know where are the poor insulated houses. We want to know where are um, places that have less infrastructure or maybe they don't even have like very stable electricity 
or which area are most of the people maybe they are more poor so in general they cannot protect themselves so much from the hazard or if they have health issues they are more difficult to seek help or seek um you know support and like those like factors um that are related to the society are, are pretty like relevant uh, for the risk assessment and at the same time we really want to look at the vulnerability right so we want to know you know where are more poor people um located um maybe like certain rural area or we're looking at where are more like young children or low income population so if really to look at the risk itself which is in the center of this fee circle we first have to know like each of you know the each of the circle and how where are the data coming from so um yeah so this is why is it important um to uh for us in my project to uh, try to push further in this whole analysis as in the current ccdr for pakistan we have like more information on the hazard itself which is like you know the heat wave event as well as other hazard however we do have like very little resources and data when we actually look at you know the exposure um and the people vulnerability because that require a lot of data and those data sometimes can be very difficult for example if really to look at the population distribution and then we have to look at maybe the only thing we have is the census data and then they can be pretty much you know um, not in a very good temporal resolution or I just say like they are pretty outdated um and as well we do not can cannot really leverage the whole capacity of like spatial data if, if we only have like one single value for the whole province and that's why um this high quality data lead to um come from as a as a main requirement for doing such um a spatial analysis for the project so you see then the consequence of heat wave can be very broad scale it doesn't only influence um the health like public health of the population maybe then um they will also you know interact with the like covid or pandemic or other situation and it also intervene with like how the agriculture production is like um may, may they may lead to then like decreased the, um harvest um or some people that they work outdoor in the agriculture sector they might suffer more and it will as well influence you know the environment itself as well as um the economy such as when we look at the power and the infrastructure so um earth observation um yeah as you by all i guess in a little bit in the background you know doing remote sensing we know that it is a very powerful tools and particularly in this case um the earth observation data don't only give us information about the remote sensing let's say we are focusing on you know which sensor to use like what kind of variable we do but more importantly particularly in this context of climate risk assessment it also can be used as some kind of like policy or one of the sources with a methodology that we can infer more um data about the society for example uh, where the poor people are uh maybe located um or what kind of maybe where are the agriculture sector so we are trying to really bridge then the earth observation from you know the like survey reflections and those value itself into more like insightful and helpful information right such as we are are those people what are the population or we want to focus on and like for example we, it can be a policy of in this as such like like poverty and this connection between the earth observation data and the like social demographics um of like pakistan or even in a border scale is really something that is like very nice to have um in the context of like this project regarding um doing climate risk assessment or extreme heat hazard assessment so um maybe a little bit about my work so previously last year um we do have some kind of like workflow to do how um to assess the climate risk itself in pakistan uh, there where we are focused in but one of the problem maybe i already mentioned earlier is really the data resolution so we do have um data let's say about um the population wealth and maybe the age group of the different population however as i said they are maybe coming from census data so they are coming from different kind of documents and they don't have really a standardized form so those data they can be the, both spatially the resolution is bad because you don't really have a grid and like a raster and to see what are the pixels values right you have very spheres like measurement and secondly those census might be done every few years 
which means that if you're looking data now, you are looking at data that I have, like, I don't know, a few years ago, and it's it pretty much like very difficult. Um, when we come to the demographics, you want to have a better proxy of, you know, how different population are exposed to certain climate hazard. And secondly, it's about the storage of the data and the processing of the data. So we have kind of focusing on this project like a rather small team so that when the state of storage is not necessarily very standardized and the processing because it requires, you know, we get to the data source, we have to first, you know, go to the different um, um, sources or website or platform to get the data and then put the data in a, you know, set more centralized location and we have to do individual processings. Um, and all these things are putting a lot of challenges uh, in the, the current workflow as we, we have like a small team and not particularly a lot of infrastructure and it makes for us um, very difficult to process the data in a way that um, maybe we have some of, we also have a multidisciplinary team, I would say. So we have more technical people and we also have, you know, maybe economists or more business people. Then they, it's also very important that the resources and the analysis can be accessible for all of the team, like not only the member that could know programming. So um, this is why we I come to like this solution of using Google Earth Engine as it's like really a standardized framework that not only us or other technical colleagues can use, but it really more accessible to, to everyone um, in the team as it can facilitate more like communication and better, yeah, better, you know, communication um, among us. So why are we using Google Earth Engine here? So I don't know, maybe quite of some of you have more knowledge on Google Earth Engine or some of you have a bit less, but um, in general, I would say in the context of this project, like Earth uh, Google Earth Engine is really providing continuous Earth observation data um, to us to do the whole assessment. So we could easily do you know time series analysis for um, different area. It's a cloud-based platform, which means that if I, um, want to show the result to my, let's say, um, colleague that are not in the technical background, like she doesn't need to, you know, get the data and know how to set up the whole thing and, you know, get the analysis one herself to actually look at just the result. Maybe actually, you know, for let's say economists or business oriented people, maybe they just want one single value at the end or they just want to know is the risk like high or no or medium or like which area, like which district I focus on and that's like, the very minimal information that they want, like at the you know the tip of the iceberg, and we have to make sure that all these things at the bottom of the iceberg is being very well organized and noted and do the analysis in order to get the final result here. So Google Earth Engine is a very good tool on that, and we also have a lot of like um, I mean on Google Earth Engine there are a lot of analysis ready data set, right? So there are a lot of data set that have super high resolution both temporally and spatially, so we don't need to worry about the computation um, that is doing on the cloud platform. And those analysis ready data set is not only regarding to the remote sensing one like modes or lens or whatever, but it is also looking into like demographic data sets, such as like the population data, um, the Google, you know, human settlement data, some land cover classification data, um, as well as we will look at the, the climate hazard uh, with the ERA model um, and like, you know, wealth of the people and so on. So we could do like large scale data processing. Um, yeah, without, without much infrastructure on our side. And, you know, if we are using the application at the end, then you don't even need to know JavaScript or Python to, to actually run it. Uh, but just the person could be with link to know, you know, that there's the certain API to build the application. So, um, and also lastly, as well as Google Earth Engine, I would say, is a very effective tool for scientific communication. Um, as you know, um, this is like an application or interface that can be accessible by non-technical users. And at the end, like if we really um, explore more on the feature of the Google Earth Engine or the application, then you will see that they are much more potential than, um, let's say, showing us graphics or showing a map with an area that you want to show or some layer that you calculate. but you will really go further and can actually put a lot of you know interactive um yeah interaction in the in the like a dashboard manner and you could even facilitate um a lot of uh more interactive plotting like chart or even giving user the possibility to upload and download um like download their data so the communication side can be very simple and effective and so this is also the 
point of this application. So this application itself is not meant to be something that include all the analysis that it could be done with um, climate risk assessments, assessment or heat uh, hazard assessment, but it's a communication tool and a framework that can be potentially also scale depending on if we have new analysis or new result, we can put in the whole framework and we can build on top of this. And, and this is the, it's a framework and communication platform that um used between let's say you know some internal users or i mean actually, actually everyone can access it uh but basically to communicate the information on the project requirement um and some workflow of our current analysis for the ccdr so actually i also want to share you that not only the standard google earth engine platform are giving us a lot of data set but they are also you know the um, awesome communities um catalog they are offering us there are a lot of very interesting data for example um this is one of the data um that our work group is also looking into is the um relative wealth index from facebook so it basically really is a very good example i think to connect um uh, remote sensing or earth observation to social demographics data so what it do it it try to collect a lot of field data you know um from the field in different countries and try to connect it to long traditional data sources like satellite data or um you know phone network and as well as like land use or other topography data and at the end trying to use deep learning technology that is done you know in the bed on the best stage um to process the data and to do like a policy for um understanding the the poverty or relative wealth in the sense um of the population in a more high um spatial resolution sense and this is not this is a data set that cover a lot of um you know countries um including countries of lower income i mean it's not like um have the global uh, coverage however for the like pakistan as well as other um global south country for example in asia that um this data set is really um giving a very good alternative compared to the original survey or census data that our group is using so yeah this is just you know example of how this data is look like you know we have the high spatial resolution uh, of the layer and um i think um our work will also try to you know and an analyze and validate um the data and find it you know match actually very well with the already like already census data that we are having and yeah, and this is what, where I mean that we are the data coming from um, the, the awesome GE community catalog. So apart from the wealth in that there are actually a lot of very cool data set. I mean, in the social, the uh, economic and population democratic side is uh, more relevant for our project. But however, they also have a lot of other cool data set that actually extend the capacity and potential beyond the standard, you know, Google Earth Engine catalog. So um, this is the framework for the heat um, hazard assessment. So we have um, very powerful, you know, computing um, platform with the Google Earth Engine to do, you know, the data processing at the back. And we have our satellite data, you know, in a very large scale, as well as not only Earth observation data, but some already like analysis ready data, such as um, you know, population, um, land cover, you know, forest change and so on. So then we have the, the API, you know, with Google Earth Engine that we can build the application from. And then we end up with um, this um, Earth observation based climate hazard toolbox that basically have three um, different components, I would say. So the first component is really to allow the user to download the data set and some of the analysis ready data. Because one of the main problems we are facing is um, for a lot of long technical user in our contest in the work group that when we need to find one single data layer we always have to go to a specific website and might be where to register might be we don't but when we download the data it is not only in the area that i'm interested in but maybe the whole grid you know if i'm only interested in karachi i cannot just get data from karachi and if i only want one value at the end what i need to do is i have to download the whole you know, layer of data, and it may be huge. I, I mean, the, the volume, and then I have to process it in a way, and then I have to get the data only for this single city. And even if I only want one FH value, then I have to do it um, all by myself, or I have to know how to program to, you know, get everything one. So this toolbox really allow a function that the user can just get the data of what they need, where exactly they want, um, even and the um, resolution that they want. Uh, 
they desired, and they can uh, download the data on the flight through the application. So the second uh, component of the toolbox is some analysis like tool. It doesn't um, it have a coverage of different analysis function. However, the user can choose, you know, which analysis task they want. Then it included something like, you know, visualize some layers on the map as well as getting some more statistic, like more simple statistical analysis um, about the layer they are looking at or the variable they are actually interested in. For example, in this case, you see then the land cover and the uh, distribution um, and the ratio of them. And the third component um, is something particularly um, helpful for, you know, our, our project context. Um, as a lot of the time um, when the World Bank work group, they're looking at, you know, how to prioritize which sources or project funding, they really want to look everything in the district level. So if you give them a raster, it's very difficult to let them formulate, okay, where should be the resources put in, like which, which area, because then, you know, we have like, a lot of, high resolution like grid, but it doesn't give them, you know, except that clear information, you know, which area then um, should we look in. And that's why the third component is really focused on this carol path map, which um basically derive the you know the country into different admin level and then we could you know put the analysis ready data or some variable you can calculate um into a spatial distribution where the user um can compare you know the differences between different districts. And so, yeah, I would say, so this Google Earth Engine framework might be is a little bit different than the other ones uh, regarding a few characters. So first of all, it is really a global framework. So it's not really like a research results that publish on one single study site and showing you a, a result of that like area. However, this is like a global framework. So the user could, as well as looking into Pakistan or looking into South Africa or, you know, China and, who could do the same analysis for different countries. And secondly, we are also looking at the social dimension. So it means that we are not looking at only remote sensing data here, but we are also using the capacity of those uh, analysis ready data set to look at and the population. So related to exposure of the hazard or vulnerability, for example, looking at the relative wealth of the population. So then this is also beyond remote sensing in a way. And thirdly, this is also beyond visualization as our final tool of our final goal is not only for data visualization. We do not want our colleague to only look at a raster layer, but we want to let them know what this chat they should focus on or put the resources in. So it also, this toolbox also allow like function like for example, um, deriving the, the whole um, layer in, you know, um, CSV file so they can actually download the data with one single value for each this chat and to do comparison or even they can download the raster themselves and th so that they can do their own, you know, spatial analysis, let's say using QGIS or some other software. So so I guess this is a few character about um, this Google Earth Engine application. So, um, so this is how, you know, the more uh, structure of this application is look like. Mm. So we have the standard framework, uh, standard data catalog, as well as we have the Google, you know, the awesome GE um, community catalog. So then we have different kind of um, data layers that can be categorized into uh, analysis ready data layers, as well as the Earth observation data. The obs Earth observation data then will be computed into, you know, different climate variables. And then we try to combine them. Let's say we combine, you know, surface temperature with the population density or with the population wealth, and then we can do categorical analysis. And afterward, we will go through a geo-boundary global database, which is basically defining a social or political and mean boundaries of different countries so that we can derive this, let's say, a raster layer um, into a district level analysis. Then this district level analysis will be further derived into the three components I was um, um, explaining uh, earlier. So into data visualization or exporting CSV file or downloading um, like a raster layer for further analysis. So um if you have built you know google earth engine you know app beforehand um you might also notice that actually with the google earth engine like a require function can be can be used as importing a library so as this 
like framework or the toolbox is rather like complex in the sense there are many functionalities going on and um, there are many different kind of components. So I was um, using really a lot of this library function with um, the, the required function. So we can have completely module, more modular, you know, level of coding to make sure, you know, the whole um, framework is more scalable and I can add layer afterward or I can add the specific analysis function into the application afterward. And instead of making, you know, one single script where maybe, uh, uh, you know, where then we could do it really to do a, a very simple analysis. So uh, we have then the interface uh, component of this application, so which is defining like the styling as well as the lead document for the user. What is this layer about? You know, uh, what analysis is doing? What are the goals? What are the units? And so on. So those are the interface component. And we have the analytic function component, which is defining, you know, which data set to use. And, you know, what's the configuration of the data set? Like, if the user want to see which data set, so I showed it in, uh, you know, what kind of color scale, what kind of uh, uh, like colors or what kind of unit um, and what are the input and for different data set the pre-processing step can be different and all this um, definition need to be defined in different um, different libraries as the analytical function so if you um, have access to the github link then you might actually see this is how the whole github repository is structured and at the end we have the visualization um, group and the visualization group, including information like, like what kind of chart we are making, like how to do different charts for different layers, what kind of, you know, variable might lead to predefined in different colors, and how to handle error if, you know, the layer is not available in certain area that the user choose, um, the styling of the chart, and so on. So uh, some example functionality of the application, including detecting heat wave, let's say using Landsat time series data in a certain um, you know, um, city. Uh, we could also look at the vegetation changes um, in like, I mean, um, level two area, let's say, as well as we can look at the urban density and download the layers. We can look at like critical infrastructure and what's the density and the development um, of that single district. Uh, we can look at also the um, relative wealth um, layers that to see where are the maybe a less like lower income population coming from um, as well as we can like look at um, the effect like for example the urban heat island. So um, those are you know some of the things that can be done. I would say this project is either in a you know ongoing stage and so those you know functionality is not something complete but something like we, we like gradually build up and and can be further explain uh, explain so this is also how um, the structure of um, the code um, or the application is like at the moment so yeah I think some strength about this application is it doesn't require user you know to program um, and as well as this is one single platform. So, you know, now our colleague from the work group doesn't need to go for different websites to download different data to do the processing, but they can have every information in one single platform. So if they want to give feedback, they could also as well, you know, just take a few button and already know, okay, this is what they want to develop further. And this is what they think they are more relevant. Um, and this application can also be used across focus areas. So our work group is really looking at Pakistan, but it also means that we also have other work group in the World Bank. Um, and they may be looking at area like Namibia or Thailand or so on, and they could have used the same framework um, to do their um, different analysis. So which is really a big achievement and progress compared to the existing workflow beforehand where every time we have the workflow and they want to look at a different area, they need to get data from the different area. And then the data need to go to the one who know programming to, you know, set up the whole workflow again and do the analysis. And if the thing is not standardized, like the data format, then a lot of things need to be adjusted. And those are the things that are only accessible and available to the, to the technical person and not the other people. So I guess this is one, you know, big change um, after um, the setup of the dashboard. Um, so I just show you, you know, very short animation um, about, you know, how the tool is locked like here. So I would say the, the layout is more minimal, but the functional part is most importantly um, that the user could, you know, you know, define um, the area they would want to look at, for example, in Austria with a specific and mean area. 
and you know like a legend of color visualization is pretty fun so this is um not something that they're usually to worry about and this is a download tool which means the main function is to download the data so um so there are maybe depend on which layer there are some people processing maybe actually of uh, doing beforehand and the user could also define you know the uh, best solution so it means that the resampling is also in the background so then the user can actually download the data and meet, uh, directly from the whole um yeah from from the whole area or uh, without worrying about like resampling and other processing steps and so on so um yeah the second tool is for analysis so which means there are um you know there are multiple pages actually so this is only one of the uh, analysis tasks and with a very similar setup and layout the user can choose the area that they want to look at and then um we have the map visualization as well as some uh, more simple statistic about you know the, the layer itself and you know um if you use google F engine you also know that those charting can be further used for uh, getting a tabular data for example if i exp explain that the pie chart i could actually download um the data that is um um embedded um, in the charge and you also have some more interactive um sessions like plotting so you don't really have one static chart but more you have more of yeah um, um dynamic element going on so um third um component is the thing one i mentioned with the um core of path map so this is basically a map comparison that is particularly used for digital level analysis so it only provide the most important information, which is, you know, defining with different disk chat that are correlated to different layer of variable that we want to focus in. So what the user can do is they can choose two variables they want to compare, and then they could get it into, let's say, um, they could see a map comparison to get a border overview, or if they actually want to do further analysis on that, um, they can also go to the charting or even from the chart you can also download csv file which is a layer table then they could also do you know the normal workflow they have for example i don't know doing gis analysis or put you know do some other uh, visualization that they want to, to put in the report and so on so i think the tool also allow this flexibility that um yeah the user can can choose like they if they want to have like a raster or a csv file or just to look at the result visually so yeah, this is um, all I want to share with you, I guess. Um, if you have more questions, you know, I'm happy to, to discuss with you. And yeah, thank you for taking your time to join us. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Kahe. This was great. And um, everyone who would like also the GitHub repo and the uh, links, we can also make them available later on in email to everyone who, who registered. So now I will try to uh, get the screen back to share the uh, question and answer session. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Let me switch over to the presentation here. So for those who are in watching the stream, I encourage you to go to this website, either on your mobile phone, scanning the QR code, or you can go to slido.com and type in the event code, which is hashtag EEUM. And this will take you to this page uh, where we will first do a short warm up. So um, just to make sure this is working, feel free to add in which country are you joining from today with, with your phone or uh, from the website. So I'm going to also try, try with my phone here. Okay. So I see UK over there. So I'm joining from Germany. Okay, so we'll give people a bit more time to share. Turkey. Sounds like mostly a European group here for now. All right, okay, so it looks like it's working for, for some of the folks. So 
um, this QR code is going to stay in the left corner and you can join us as well when we go to the Q&A part, which is now. So um, I've just opened the, the question and answer session. So if you have a question, you can type it in and post it and it will appear on the screen and we can discuss the questions together. So I, I really uh, want to say a huge thank you to Kahe for going into detail into all the different components of uh, the app that was built and also how it was used to integrate into the workflow of the people who are actually using this data. Because oftentimes as people who work with geospatial data, we um, use a lot of raster data, but then when we interface with uh, the, the actual people who will be using this uh, information, they prefer data in a CSV format at the district level, for example. So it's great that you showed how um, the charting capabilities in Earth Engine plus these exports into uh, district level CSVs were, are also possible because that really is very powerful then for um, end users to actually integrate that into their decision making and program um, design. So um, another thing that came to mind was um, how you described the use of the require function to create different libraries that will then allow you to add to the app and modify it in the future. This is definitely a good tip for anyone developing um, complex apps or apps that need to be maintained because this will then break down your code into um, smaller chunks that are more easily updated and maintained rather than having to look in your giant long script for this tiny few lines that adjust something in the interface or the design. So it's a really good tip that um, Kahe shared there. And I'm also, actually I have a question for Kahe about um, the resampling that you mentioned for the download tool. Um, so I, I'm curious as to who is using this resampled data afterwards and are they, um, do they know about like, what is involved in resampling and um, potential, uh, yeah, what, what, it, what it means to, to have the resampled data. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to, I'm curious about who's using this uh, resampled data. Um, yeah, as this dashboard is really built mostly for more internal use between the colleagues of, of different work groups. So, so I, I think what is important in the sense that uh, is the download of the raster data and with the resampling, mm -hmm. the most important point is, um, so the resolution actually changed, right? So for some of the colleagues that might be not so important for them to get very high resolution layer, let's say the original data might be 10 meter. If they only mm -hmm. want to get like one single value for the disk chat is like, they do not really need this high pixel information. And one of the also the important thing is there are do have limitation between the Google Earth Engine, right? For example, you cannot dynamically know a huge area of data in super fine resolution and then won't work. So that, that I think where one of the things with resampling is that it can allow, it doesn't matter like which uh, area that you are looking at, you could always then also find our solution to get the raster data uh, out from the Google Earth Engine application. So that's also, I think, one important aspect that we have also have to look at um, the original, you know, computational limit of Google Earth Engine. So as well as, you know, it really it depend on the user need if they need the highest uh, resolution um, at the end for the analysis. And um, in your interactions with these users, were there people, um, are, are these people also like geospatial data experts or would you say they understand like to what level they should resample to, like they can make this decision as a, and make this as an informed decision rather than say, okay, let me try a few times and see what level is the, the highest resolution I can download. Um, or, or are they able to say like for the phenomena I want to, to observe, actually I just need hundred meters and that's enough. So I will resample this data to hundred meters. Which yeah. which is the group? Just I mean, yeah, this is more like you know a, a more pioneer and experimental work. So actually, okay. the colleague I, I was uh, mostly targeting, they do not know much about geospatial and programming in general. Okay. So I guess for them, the maybe the more useful thing is the visualization part, and as well as getting the the C uh, the CSV table data. Um, yeah. However, it's just also a possibility that. Um, the person could also download the geospatial format. Um, however, if you ask the main audience that in my work group, 
um, really for the project, I think they are really, yeah, try to get the data as simple as possible, mm -hmm. maybe even in, in table, uh, yeah, in the table mm -hmm. format, yeah. So are there, are there questions from the audience? I, I uh, suggest, again, uh, feel free to type in the, the questions you have um, either on your phone scanning the QR code and send it in so we can also have some of your uh, inputs for, for this great presentation that was uh, shared with, with us today. Okay, so while we while we wait for the questions to come in, um, uh, another question that I would have is, so from from developing this project, uh, what would you say was some of the the biggest takeaways that you you learned just from working with different people to design the app, understand what they needed from it, and um, creating it? What 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 are some of the tips you can give for other people who are also designing apps for non-technical audiences? Mm, I guess one of the main thing that I also learned myself is actually this app is something that is not proposed by, you know, let's say my um, non-technical um, boss or something. And this is something out of my initiative. And I think some of the time for those the non-technical audience, at least in my case, it was the case that they sometimes do not know what exactly are the solution that can solve the problem. They maybe they know that there is some problem that they don't understand because um, that is the case that before I joined the work group, there have been all the work for other telecom people are working on a solution and everything is in Jupyter logbook. And I think it's also important that you observe during the maybe meeting or like communication, you start to realize there is definitely gap, right? So while the analysis um, is very updated for our member in the technical team, we have the you know non-technical person that might not understand you know the detail of what has been done. And I think I think as the one who are in between the you know interface between technical and non-technical colleagues, it's very important to be a little bit uh, give a little bit self initiative to see what are the needs there, and you could maybe propose something. And I think one funny thing I also find out is after I have this whole dashboard and show it to my, like, let's say, a boss, or which is an economist, like, she realized, okay, this is the thing I wanted, but she never have said this is the thing she wanted. So I, I think that, I think, yeah, that's the important point is to really try to have good communication and, and seeing, you know, the background or the base side of every person that you're working with. And sometimes maybe you could also maybe be the one who know better about what can be the solution out there. Absolutely. It's so important to listen and then you can share like what the possibilities are because they often don't know what the solutions may be from, from the geospatial space. So that's definitely a good takeaway. Um, I'm curious, how, how will the project continue to be maintained? Um, I know you mentioned there were some additional functionalities that uh, look interesting that may be developed in the future. Um, is there still a group of people who will be maintaining and updating this app? Um, I think that's actually a good question. And that's also actually come to, you know, the structure of the whole big like organization. So from my understanding is that, you know, we really have a small group and we do not like, let's say we have a lot of like, people that are maintaining it. However, I think one thing that I found out is kind of like a positive outcome is that um, I reach some of the other colleagues in the other work group and they are actually very interesting in the framework. So I think the, at the end, the main achievement of the app itself is not really exactly this app, but it's to provide a solution of a framework or possibility that which have, for example, I have the other colleague from the other group, they said, oh, they are really interested after seeing what can be done and they want to do exactly the same thing, but with the data that they have, and maybe this work group is focusing something else, maybe looking at public health or looking at other data and they want to use the same framework to do the stuff and they ask for like, for example, supporting their project and so on. So I guess, yeah, I would say, I would say the maybe the, the main uh, takeaway or output for me of the whole app is not really the app itself, but um, 
And also, yeah, it will be you further develop, but um, I don't know what it will uh, bring in the future, but I think there's definitely something I know that this uh, framework is also bringing a lot of different possibility for different work doing similar analysis. And I know this type of analysis was, you know, I asked in many different, you know, institute or work group, and a lot of time we are doing very similar tasks and we are trying to, you know, find like a better framework. Um, yeah, that could be, between the like the data and the technical part and as well as decision making. It's great that um, your app has inspired other work groups to also consider what is possible and maybe in the future also invest in developing something like this. So somebody posted here a question, can I reproduce the Earth Engine app using the provided GitHub repo? I am new and would like to see a workshop on the details and steps. So do you think it's possible for, for the app to be uh, reproduced using using the code you provided? Um, yes, uh, I think first of all, um, actually there are many, many, many things that a user can do depend on maybe which like, level of um, Earth engine you, you are in. I think there's this, you know, you could definitely then connect the function between the GitHub and the Earth engine. And you could then, most importantly, you have to have then all the script, which is actually, I don't know, maybe over 100 of them um, to be put on the repository. And you could also use, um, you know, the same, um, same cluster of script to build the app itself. Uh, I mean, I haven't really done it by myself, but I know that there is this possibility um, to connect, you know, between the uh, the GitHub and Earth Engine. Um, that's that's also why I I, I can um, you know get automatically update every time I update the Earth Engine script or so, uh, upload in the uh, GitHub repository. However, if you are you know rather new to Earth Engine, um, there are different folders um, in the um, the GitHub repository, and some of the folders are more showing like the analysis part. Uh, which is more like a demo script. So I guess maybe for people that are not really um, starting with application, but want to understand better with the analysis function and all this thing, maybe you could look at the demo script uh, instead of, you know, the different module for the interface itself. That might be more useful. But let's say if you're really um, yeah, interesting in the interface and the element, I think I also um, derived that, you know, or like interface, interface folder, which include different kind of, like functions for Google Earth Engine. Um, for example, let's say um, an inspector function that you can get pawn in the, the Carol Fab map and you can get the value out of it in the screen, or you could put like a pop-up window uh, in Google Earth Engine. So you have the button to open and close. Um, as well, you have documentation, your button I separate different elements um, in the, I think it's called interface um, folder um, of the repository. So you can, you know, maybe go through it, then you could also understand better how it I think one also nice thing you could do is as as I said, I'm using um different script in like a library format, so you could require you could also as well um I think on the top of every script there is like uh, a path of this script uh from that you could actually require yourself. So mean that if you have Google F Engine account and you could also require my script from your script, you know, then you can use the fun of my function that I built, just like you import a library, and then you can do also further analysis about. So this is also one thing I found out that you could also uh, work very well. For example, like I'm also using a library, like some color peptide uh, library, you know, from other users, and we could um, yeah, use the function for, for, for different purposes. Absolutely. I hope I hope this helped a little bit. I, I would also agree that I'm developing an Earth Engine app immediately as a new user would not, I wouldn't recommend it because it's quite complicated and um, it would be better to yeah, take a look at the um, demo, demo scripts and try and read, read through and understand what each part of the code is doing. And that will help you already understand the structure. Um, so I guess there's also a request here in the future for maybe future consulting that Akahi can provide and uh, feel free to contact her on, on Twitter or via LinkedIn um, after, after this workshop. Yeah, so are there any other questions from the audience? We have about one minute left. Okay, so I don't see any further questions. 
So I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us today. And um, do remember to join us again in April for Kristen O'Shea's talk. I welcome you all to um, join us again. Stay, stay, in, uh, stay in touch. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out as well. So thank you again, Kahe, for, the, for this great talk. And I wish everyone a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye, everyone.